You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We are here today with Larry J. Young. He is the co-author of The Chemistry Between Us, Love, Sex, and the Science of Attraction. He is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Emory University, and he's also the director of the Center for Translational Social Neuroscience, as well as the chief of the Division of Behavioral Neuroscience and Psychiatric Disorders. Dr. Young is an expert on a couple of neuropeptides we're going to be talking a lot about today called oxytocin and vasopressin and how those neuropeptides can regulate the neuroprocessing of social signals and social attachment. In other words, we're going to be talking about love, we're going to be talking about sex, we're going to be talking about bonding and attraction and how all of that works in the brain. And we're going to be sure to make it super relevant for parents and teenagers. Dr. Young, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Normally, it's nice to start is by just kind of asking you a little bit about your background and about kind of how you got into this field, how you got into, um, you know, the the really interesting research that you're doing, and um, and then also how you got into writing about it. Okay. I'm a neuroscientist interested in the brain mechanisms that give rise to social behaviors, uh, parenting behaviors, love, um, all kinds of social interactions. And, and I got started because you know, I grew up on a, a, a farm and uh, there were lots of animals around and I could see all of these animals, these different species of animals had different instincts. They, they, did, but they weren't taught how to behave who to partner with, how to take care of babies, or things like that. Those kinds of instincts were somehow ingrained into their brain as their brain developed. And I realized that that was because they had genes that told their brains how to develop. So I I thought it was really cool to be able to try to understand how you can go from like genetic instructions in your chromosomes to the development of a brain into an organism that knows how to behave in the way that that species is supposed to behave. And so uh, I, I, after going to college, I went to uh, graduate school and I studied actually the, the sexual behavior in lizards and homosexual behavior in lizards. There are lizards that engage in homosexual behavior. And, you know, I spent several years just trying to understand, you know, what is different in the brain of a homosexual lizard versus ones that are uh, heterosexual lizards. Uh, But that experience just, you know, I I just learned more about the brain and got more interested in really diversity. Hmm. We don't all behave the same. We don't have the same motivations. But also like the strength of the parenting motivation, the motherhood. You know, that's something you could just look around and all animals, you know, as soon as they have babies, you know, if they're mammals, they take care of those babies or birds even, you know. So, you know, I wanted to understand how that motivation arises, but also why, why is there diversity in different species? And when I talk about diversity and behavior, you know, maybe you can think about it in terms of dog breeds. You've got pit bulls, you've got basset hounds, you've got chihuahuas, you've got all these different dogs. They're all the same species, sure, but they have different personality traits. And so you can understand that, you know, from the brain. Uh, but also from a more practical perspective of, you know, why is this important? Um, you know, being able to form bonds and uh, relationships and just to be able to read e- each other's emotions and things like that is really important for our, you know, well-being and being able to survive in society. But those are also the things that go wrong in disorders like autism. So it turns out that the work that we've been doing which we'll talk about later on these little voles, is giving us insights into how we might improve social functioning in diseases like autism. So that's why I'm in the Department of Psychiatry at Emory.
And then why voles? What got you? So you went from lizards and you thought that was kind of interesting. And then something attracted you to the vole? So why voles? Well, it's very cool. You know, most mammal species, uh, males and females mate. And then after mating, the male splits and the female goes off and has her offspring by herself. There's no emotional connection between the two. Okay. Uh, but in voles, they're socially monogamous, huh. which means they're very much like people. When a male and a female prairie vole comes together, uh, they'll, the male will court the female. If the female likes that male, she'll let him mate. And when they mate, something magic happens in their brain so that from then on, those two guys want to be together. Mm. They nest together and they raise their offspring together, uh, generally for the rest of their life. Not all prairie voles do that. About If you look in the wild, about 60 to 70 percent of males have a female partner that they're living with. Uh, living that lifestyle. About 30 to 40% uh, of the males just remain bachelors all their life. They decide they don't want to, you know, settle down and, and have a nest. Yeah. But even though, you know, they're monogamous, very few are completely sexually faithful. Sometimes they do have an affair, right? An extra pair mating, but they will always come back to their partner. So to me, it just seems like, you know, that's a really good model for human beings. Right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> sounds, sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, but the other thing about the voles is that there's a different species of vole that looks just like prairie voles. Huh. If you saw them in your backyard, you, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Okay. These guys are loners. They're called meadow uh. voles. And they just don't care about being around others. So if you think about kids... You know, some kids are very, very social. They, they got lots of friends. Totally, Others yeah. are, uh, they just don't need that or they don't know how to achieve that. Metal bowls are like that and they mate and have babies just fine. But the, uh, the males doesn't, don't stick with the females. The female doesn't like the male after that. Uh, she has her babies and she actually abandons her babies two weeks after they're born. Wow. They're able to survive. So, <laughs> Uh, Good luck. But, but it's just different strategies. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And both of those strategies work they're in nature. Still right? alive and kicking as a they're species still, they're or whatever. They're still around. So, so this is uh, because of that, you know, these two these species that are so closely related yeah. look the same, but they have this very different kind of social behavior. I thought, wow, this is right. a, great, a great opportunity to try to study in the brain what makes some of them, some animals, be able to have these close relationships and bond in others where that's not so important. So I found a lot of really interesting things in your book based on your research and just on other research that you mentioned from other people. And you have great stories in here. Um, <laughs> one thing that I kind of wasn't aware of is you talk about this sexually dimorphic nucleus. And so that somehow is what's differentiating between the male and the female brain. That was like one of the, one of the things that they first noticed. Yeah, I wouldn't say that that is the, the cause of all the differences between <laughs> yeah. sexes in their behavior. Um, but, but this was a sort of an early discovery, uh, probably around 1980 or maybe in the 70s. If you take male and female rats and you stain the brain so that you can see the different brain areas, there is a part of the brain, the sexually dimorphic nucleus, in the, that is about four times larger in the male brain than in the female brain. And so that was kind of at the time a very kind of astounding finding that there is a real physical difference in a male and female brains. And that kind of research has continued and there are many uh, now more detailed uh, examples of sex differences in the brain uh, in terms of wiring or um, different aspects. But it's interesting that this, uh, this particular one, this is sort of the first one that was studied the most. Yeah. It was, it was found that, it's not really that it's genetic. It's that when males are young, okay, if we're talking about rats here, before they are born, their testes are very small. Their testicles are, are not active. And the female ovary is not active at all. It's not producing any steroids. Sure. But right around the time of birth in these rats, the uh, brain starts pumping out chemicals that activates the testicles. Yeah. The testicles start secreting testosterone. 
Testosterone is a steroid hormone that then gets in the brain and it organizes the brain at that early stage mm. and it changes the way that that brain responds to hormones for the rest of the, the, the male's life. So it's that surge of hormones that comes from the developing testes in males that helps shape the male's brains. And that's partly why males, uh, snips and snails and puppy dog tails, maybe, you know, they, <laughs> they, males have different kinds of, of behaviors from that early kind of surge. And in humans, that, that surge actually happens before the, the infant is born. But yeah, it causes some real sexual differences in the brain. And of course, there's also many cultural differences that uh, add on top of that once a child is growing up whatever particular society and culture they're in, uh, the cultural differences can add to that. But not all the differences between boys and girls are learned. So this is part of what you refer to as the organizational hypothesis. And it's this idea that the, the brain is bathed in those kind of hormones in utero. And that is what starts to create these differences in the brain. And then you have some really interesting stories in here about people who are, you know, raised as different sexes or have like different situations in their lives um, that kind of like really help you to understand um, sort of how important those uh, that early phase is where the brain is kind of differentiates, I guess. That's right. Yeah. So there are uh, cases of ambiguous genitals uh, mm. where the not clear whether when the baby is born, whether it is a, a penis or a clitoris, you know, because those two structures come from the exact same structure developmentally. At an early stage in development, the penis and the clitoris look identical. And it's only yeah. the testosterone that comes from the testicles, which I already mentioned is going into the brain and changing things in the brain. It also goes to the genitals to turn that organ into a penis. Uh, but in some cases, it, it, it doesn't, uh, there's variation in that. It. It's not like a switch, right? So if they, if for some reason, the, the infant doesn't see much testosterone, it doesn't grow a robust penis, then um, in the 60s and the 70s, there was a lot of work where they were doing sex or gender reassignment, right? Where they would do a surgery to, and then that child would be raised as a female if it was right. a boy. Um, but that child had testosterone still some early in its life. Yeah. Um, and then when they became adults, you know, even though they were raised culturally as a, a female, uh, when they became adults, then suddenly they, they, their identity was uh, male and they yeah. wanted to change. It didn't work. Yeah. Right. right. There's even a, a disorder uh, in the Dominican Republic where a certain percentage of the children are born uh, as the parents think they are females and they are raised as females because they have a deficiency in an enzyme that helps make this, this testosterone and DHT, the active uh, form of testosterone. And so those individuals actually uh, appear to be female, uh, but when they get to be a teenager and they're going through puberty, they have so wow. much of this a brain hormone that is controlling the testicles that they secrete enough of testosterone that they then become masculinized and then they, you know, sort of change their sexual identity. Just think this is, a, 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 it can be up to like 10% of the population in this island population. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm interested in diversity in, in animals, but you can see the same kind of diversity in, in humans. Yeah. I thought that story was so interesting um, in the book about uh, the Dominican Republic and yeah, ultimately, where you guys go with it and how you explain it all, uh, then it really makes a lot of sense. Um, and it, it really helps you understand the concepts, I think, when you see that uh, in context. One thing I also thought was really interesting is this difference in attraction, female attraction at different parts of the menstrual cycle. 
and you talk about maybe it might explain why some women become entangled with bad boys. So I guess <laughs> this is something that uh, I was not aware of when I was a teenager, but that I think I would want to know, you know? And uh, so I guess, uh, and especially I'd want to know if I was um, a female teenager, uh, because it's really affects your life, I guess. And um, so could you talk a little bit about what that is and how that works? Well, uh, yeah. So uh, if you think of, for, for most animals, let's, let's talk about animals for a second before we talk about humans, because yeah. we, are an, we are an animal and our behavior was sort of shaped in our evolutionary history. But for animals like uh, cats and dogs and rats and mice, uh, females are absolutely not interested in sex until they're ovulating, mm. right? Sex is for ovulation. So sexual attraction only happens when the egg is ready to be fertile, right? So if you think about cats, anybody who has a cat in heat, they know how different their sexual motivation changes from when they're not in heat to when they're in heat. Uh, because uh, what happens is you have these hormones in the female, estrogen and progesterone that are secreted by the ovary, but not secreted very much until the egg is about to ovulate. And at that point, those hormones go into the brain and suddenly change that motivation of that cat. So uh, if she's in heat, she'll do just about anything to get out of that house and to find a tomcat. Okay. Yep. And so that's animals, right? Uh, humans are quite different, very different from that. You know, we are not totally enslaved by our hormones. Uh, females, you know, their reproductive desire is not totally, you know, de defined by what stage of their cycle they're on, but human females do have the same oscillations in estrogen and progesterone, and it's related to their menstrual cycle. Yeah. So uh, it makes sense that you know maybe there are some changes in a human females' sexual desire or you know way of thinking uh, that may influence sexual choices. Some of this literature may be not agreed by everyone. So I'm, I'm not going to state this as fact, but I'll tell you that there are literature that, that, that reports this, that women who are, when they are at the time when they can be fertile, uh, they seem to be more interested in talking to, you know, flirting, uh, more into entice the bad boys. Authors will often, you know, say this is, you know, a chance to, you know, to find someone who has so strong genes and, uh, you know, but um, when they're not, they're more interested in someone who would be, you know, apparently like a good dad or something like that, you know, yeah. the, not, not the bad boy. And if you think about, uh, you know, from the perspective of if we were like animals, then it, it kind of makes sense. You might choose something different. And so that's, that's the story. And, and even there are, uh, we, we talk in the book about uh, the case of uh, strippers, how they, uh, they make more money. There was a study that showed that strippers make more money when they're ovulating. <laughs> like a lot more money. They get like twice as many tips or something. Yeah. You reported the dollar amounts in here. It's crazy. And that's probably not because the men uh, can somehow sense that they're, they're not, ovulating. They don't know. Yeah. Uh, but maybe those women are acting differently at the time they're ovulating. So for yeah. example, there, there are other studies that we mentioned uh, where women at certain times of their cycle are more likely to buy or wear really sexy high heel shoes or, you know, clothing, um, things like that. Mm. But like I said, that, that literature, some people contest that. And, um, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure how much of that is really true now that several years after writing the book. So I'm not trying to promote that idea, but okay. there are studies out there showing that kind of thing. And maybe, you know, parents <laughs> can make up their own mind. It's definitely interesting. And it would be some, uh, it's definitely something to think about and know about. And yeah, to always be mindful of and consider how things like that can affect us. And I guess it's just an example of like how important biology is and what's happening in our body and like the whole picture is on our decision-making process. And, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and even in, you know, um, well, in both boys and girls, you know, pre-puberty yeah. versus post-puberty, there is a huge difference. And that's not just because someone told them that they should be doing this, mm -hmm. that certain topics should be occupying their 
thoughts. Uh, this is, uh, you know, th this is real changes that are happening in the body that are just, you know, they're, they're, these hormones are getting into the brain, causing transcription changes in, you know, of genes in different brain areas and, you know, all kinds of things happening in the brain. And uh, it's, it's a real phenomenon. Where do fetishes come from and uh, how do they develop? Yeah, this is another interesting story that we, that we talk about in the book. And this is, this is really about sort of the linking of the brain's sex experiences and reward systems to other things that are around uh, in the environment. So, um, so as you know, uh, sexual behavior is really, really rewarding. It releases a lot of dopamine, and that dopamine activates the reward system. Feels good, yeah. Yes, and uh, at that time, uh, there's a lot of seeking of activation of the reward system or during uh, teenage years. But yeah. so we talk about a study, that, and again, this is not my study. I'm not trying to promote this idea, but there are people who have said that, you know, maybe fetishes for uh, things like shoes, which, you know, why would someone have a fetish for a shoe? That has nothing to do right. with sexuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, one of my colleagues, Jim Faust, formerly at Concordia University, made the proposition that, you know, maybe teenage boys, when they have their first have their first uh, sort of a sexual experience through masturbation, uh, maybe they're in a place where there are shoes and the yep. mother's closet or something like that, you know, and right just gets kind of linked in there somehow yeah so so basically it's this and we talk about this later in the book in terms of, uh, of how we fall in love you know we fall in love because uh, we're having uh, a good rewarding dopamine releasing experience with a person with a certain kind of hair and a certain kind of face and that person yeah. we develop a fetish towards that person and so that's a natural process of bonding yeah and, and maybe a fetish is just a simpler version of that. It's where when you, that gets like directed towards something right. that's not a person. Yeah. Interesting. It's kind of like when a drug addict, you know, if they're using a drug with a certain, uh, say, glass pipe, then suddenly that glass pipe gets, uh, gets them aroused uh, yeah. you know, in terms of the drug seeking behavior, not sexually. And there's no reason that it should accept that their brain is now associated that with that dopamine. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, so Jim has this very interesting uh, idea that fetishes arise because whatever the subject of the fetish is, is something that the person has been around during their early sexual experiences from perhaps masturbation. Yeah. yeah, even including masturbation, which I think is so interesting. And, you know, parents don't want to talk about masturbation with teenagers. It's awkward. I get it. But I think it's such a good example of how it's important at like what whatever your teenagers are doing, uh, they're get, they're masturbating right now. And how are they doing that? And that actually matters. And that could be creating some of these things. There could be uh, weird fetishes getting created just because, you know, uh, they're forced to like masturbate in some like in a closet or like so weird because they feel like embarrassed or ashamed about it because it hasn't been talked about or I, whatever. I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, having the conversation and bringing it out in the open right. um, is is good you know and um certainly masturbation is a natural process that yeah a very large percentage of people do during development and uh it shouldn't be people should not be, be made ashamed of it because that creates a lot of kinds of confusion in the brain mm. i think is probably not good we are here today with Larry Young talking about love, sex, and the science of attraction. And we're not done yet. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. So there are ways of bonding. So there are studies that show that in girls, when they hear their mom's voice, they get oxytocin release. If they get a text from their mom, they don't. The one thing I want to point out is that, you know, by studying this in animals, we gain insights into humans. And those insights not only tell us, you know, maybe why our child behaves in a certain way, but it also gives us tools to be able to improve people's quality of life. 
the oxytocin stimulates that bonding and that motivation to nurture. But if you don't have that to begin with, then you have to use the rest of your brain, your cortex to say, I need to do this in order to stimulate this oxytocin system. And if I do that every day, you know, or increase that, then I will have a stronger connection with my child. And that stronger connection may actually help build a more healthy social brain that will help them get through adult life. Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get unlimited access to all the interviews I've conducted. It's completely affordable and your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.